Lads and ladies, welcome to the Junior Classics. Hi there, I'm Sir Bradley Hassey, a teller of borrowed tales. Join me as I share stories of courage, adventure, and wonder. But don't take my word for it. You can find out for yourself on today's Junior Classic. Welcome back, Junior Scholars. My name is Sir Bradley Hassey, guardian of the written word in your guide through the Junior Classics. Every episode, we explore a classic story to elevate the mind and spirit. Our mission is to inspire children and families with a love of good reading and a real and lasting interest in Western literature, history, and scholarship. If this is your first time listening, thank you for joining us, and a very special thank you to my loyal listeners who tune in each and every episode. Thank you very much. Last week, we read the story of Bluebeard and learned why we should not live in fear. The story is certainly not for the faint of heart, but for those brave enough to listen, you will be rewarded with a message of hope and rescue. Go back and give it a listen if you missed it. This week's story is called The Brave Little Tailor. The version we are reading was published anonymously, (laughs) anonymously, which means whoever recorded it did not reveal who they were. However, there were other versions of the story published by the Brothers Grimm and Joseph Jacobs. What I learned about in my research for this tale is that many of these tales we have read and will read have several themes in common. Some in our story today include feats of strength and valor, such as squeezing water from a stone, a contest in throwing stones, a contest in carrying a tree, and attempting to kill the hero in his bed. One that particularly stood out to me is tricking giants to fight each other. One of my favorite books, The Hobbit, has a scene in which Gandalf the wizard tricks three trolls to fight each other. I think it would be a cool exercise to see if you can start spotting these themes and others in stories that you come across. But before we get to today's story, Lost and Found Words! Listen carefully to the meaning of these words and try and spot them during the story. Our first word today is contemptuous. This means to feel contempt, which is a strong feeling of dislike or disrespect for something. I'm pretty sure you would be contemptuous of food that tastes horrible. Our next word is weltering. This means twisting or tossing or deeply sunk or soaked in. Used in a sentence, you could say, the grimy worms were weltering in the muddy water. Next, we have girdle. A girdle is a belt or cord worn about the waist. Our brave little tailor wears a girdle in our story today that brings him much luck. And lastly is whey. Whey is the watery part of milk that separates when making cheese or yogurt. In our story today, there is a scene where a giant is so strong, he can squeeze a stone with his hands until water drips out. Our brave little tailor tricks the giant into thinking he is just as strong and can also squeeze water out of a stone, but he is actually squeezing the whey out of a block of cheese he is carrying. And now, on to the show! I want you to imagine that you are back in a time when the only clothes you had were shapeless and made of rough material. Your clothes do not fit precisely around your arms and legs, They do not stretch when you sit or stand. They are not as warm in the winter or cool in the summer. And since they don't fit well, your clothes are often getting snagged on something, tearing and are in constant need of repair. If you are a peasant, which means a poor farmer or worker during the Middle Ages, this is an accurate description of the clothing available to you. It does not sound very comfortable, does it? However, If you had enough money as a free man, a merchant, or a member of the nobility, like a king or queen, you could hire somebody to make you clothing of quality. The person you would hire was called a tailor. A tailor is somebody whose job it is to make, repair, or alter clothing. 
The main character in our story today is a tailor. Medieval tailoring skills were passed down from a master to an apprentice through learning on the job. They were hired to create all type of clothing, from underwear to silk gowns. Most clothes were made from wool. Other materials like leather and silk were also used. Only the wealthiest could afford silk, which was worn as much to be seen as it was to be felt. A tailor would most likely not be extremely poor, but he wouldn't be wealthy either. The brave little tailor in our story is not content with a simple job, so he sets off into the wide world in hopes of improving his fortune. Let's see how it goes. The Brave Little Tailor by Anonymous. One summer's day, a little tailor sat on his table by the window in the best of spirits and sewed for dear life. As he was sitting thus, a peasant woman came down the street, calling out, Good jam to sell! Good jam to sell! This sounded sweetly in the tailor's ears. He put his little head out of the window and shouted, Up here, my good woman, and you'll find a willing customer. The woman climbed up three flights of stairs with her heavy basket to the tailor's room, and he made her spread out the pots in a row before him. He examined them all, lifted them up and smelt them, and said at last, This jam seems good. Weigh me four ounces of it, my good woman, and even if it's a quarter of a pound, I won't stick at it. The woman, who had hoped to find a good market, gave him what he wanted, but went away grumbling wrathfully. Now heaven shall bless this jam for my use, and it shall sustain and strengthen me. He fetched some bread out of a cupboard, cut a round off the loaf, and spread the jam on it. That will taste good, but I'll finish that waistcoat first before I take a bite. He placed the bread beside him, went on sewing, and out of the lightness of his heart, kept on making his stitches bigger and bigger. In the meantime, the smell of the sweet jam rose to the ceiling, where swarms of flies were gathered, and attracted them to such an extent that they swarmed on to it in masses. Ha! Who invited you? said the tailor, and chased the unwelcome guests away. But the flies, who didn't understand English, refused to let themselves be warned off, and returned again in even greater numbers. At last the tailor, losing all patience, reached out of his chimney corner for a duster and exclaiming, Wait, and I'll give it to you. He beat them mercilessly with it. When he left off, he counted the slain, and no fewer than seven lay dead before him with outstretched legs. What a brave fellow I am, said he, and was filled with admiration at his own courage. The whole town must know about this. And in great haste, the little tailor cut out a girdle, hemmed it, and embroidered on it in big letters, Seven at a blow. What did I say? The town? No, the whole world shall hear of it. And his heart beat for joy as a lamb wags his tail. The tailor strapped the girdle round his waist and set out into the wide world, for he considered his workroom too small a field for his bravery. Before he set forth, he looked round about him to see if there was anything in the house he could take with him on his journey. But he found nothing except an old cheese which he took possession of. In front of the house, he observed a bird that had been caught in some bushes, and this he put into his wallet beside the cheese. Then he went on his way merrily, and being light and quick, he never felt tired. His way led up a hill on the top of which sat a powerful giant, who was calmly surveying the landscape. The little tailor went up to him and greeted him cheerfully and said, Good day, friend. There you sit at your ease, viewing the whole wide world. I'm just on my way there. What do you say to accompanying me? The giant looked contemptuously at the tailor and said, What a poor, wretched little creature you are. That's a good joke, answered the little tailor. And unbuttoning his coat, he showed the giant the girdle. There, now you can read what sort of fellow I am. The giant read, Seven at a blow. And thinking they were human beings the tailor had slain, he had a certain respect for the little man. But first he thought he'd test him. So taking up a stone in his hand, he squeezed it till some drops of water ran out. Now you do the same, 
if you really wish to be thought strong. Is that all? That's child's play to me. So he dived into his wallet, brought out the cheese, and pressed it till the whey ran out. My squeeze was better than yours. The giant didn't know what to say, for he couldn't have believed it of the little fellow. To prove him again, the giant lifted a stone and threw it so high that the eye could hardly follow it. Now, my little dwarf, let me see you do that. Well thrown, but, after all, your stone fell to the ground. I'll throw one that won't come down at all. He dived into his wallet again, and grasping the bird in his hand, he threw it up into the air. The bird, enchanted to be free, soared up into the sky and flew away, never to return. Well, what do you think of that little piece of business, friend? You can certainly throw, but now let's see if you can carry a proper weight. With these words, he led the tailor to a huge oak tree, which had been felled to the ground, and said, If you are strong enough, help me carry the tree out of the wood. Most certainly. Just you take the trunk on your shoulder. I'll bear the top and branches, which is certainly the heaviest part. The giant laid the trunk on his shoulder, but the tailor sat at his ease among the branches, and the giant, who couldn't see what was going on behind him, had to carry the whole tree, and the little tailor into the bargain. There he sat behind in the best of spirits, lustily whistling a tune, as if carrying the tree were mere sport. The giant, after dragging the heavy weight for some time, could get on no farther and shouted out, Hi, I must let the tree fall. The tailor sprang nimbly down, seized the tree with both hands, as if he had carried it the whole way, and said to the giant, Fancy a big lazy fellow like you not being able to carry a tree. They continued to go on their way together, and as they passed by a cherry tree, the giant grasped the top of it, where the ripest fruit hung gave the branches into the tailor's hand, and bade him eat. But the little tailor was far too weak to hold the tree down. And when the giant let go, the tree swung back into the air, bearing the little tailor with it. When he had fallen to the ground again, without hurting himself, the giant said, What? Do you mean to tell me you haven't the strength to hold down a feeble twig? It wasn't strength that was wanting. Do you think that would have been anything for a man who has killed seven at a blow? I jumped over the tree because the huntsmen are shooting among the branches near us. Do you do the like if you dare? The giant made an attempt, but couldn't get over the tree, and stuck fast in the branches, so that here too the little tailor had the better of him. Well, you're a fine fellow after all. Come and spend the night with us in our cave. The little tailor willingly consented to do this. And following his friend, they went on till they reached a cave where several other giants were sitting round a fire, each holding a roast sheep in his hand, of which he was eating. The little tailor looked about him and thought, Yes, there's certainly more room to turn around in here than in my workshop. The giant showed him a bed and bade him lay down and have a good sleep. But the bed was too big for the little tailor, so he didn't get into it, but crept away into the corner. At midnight, when the giant thought the little tailor was fast asleep, he rose up, and taking his big iron walking stick, he broke the bed in two with a blow, and thought he had made an end of the little grasshopper. At early dawn, the giants went off to the wood, and quite forgot about the little tailor, till all of a sudden, they met him trudging along in the most cheerful manner. The giants were terrified at seeing him, and fearing lest he should slay them, they all took to their heels as fast as they could. The little tailor continued to follow his nose, and after he had wandered about for a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and feeling tired, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. While he lay there, the people came, and looking him all over, read on his girdle, Seven at a blow? Oh, what can this great hero of a hundred fights want in our peaceful land? He must indeed be a man of mighty valor. They went and told the king about him, and said what a weighty and useful man he'd be in time of war, and that it would be well to secure him at any price. This counsel pleased the king, and he sent one of his courtiers down to the little tailor, 
to offer him, when he awoke, a commission in their army. The messenger remained standing by the sleeper and waited till he stretched his limbs and opened his eyes. And when he tendered his proposal, That's the very thing I came here for. I am quite ready to enter the king's service. So he was received with all honor and given a special house of his own to live in. But the other officers were angry at the success of the little tailor and wished him a thousand miles away. What's to come of it all? If we quarrel with him, he'll let out at us. And at every blow, seven will fall. There will soon be an end to us. So they resolved to go in a body to the king and all to send in their papers. We are not made to hold out against a man who kills seven at a blow. The king was grieved at the thought of losing all his faithful servants for the sake of one man, and he wished heartily that he had never set eyes on him, and that he could get rid of him, but he didn't dare to send him away, for he feared he might kill him and place himself on a throne. He thought long and deeply over the matter, and finally came to a conclusion. He sent for the tailor, and told him that, seeing what a great and warlike hero he was, he was about to make him an offer. In a certain wood of his kingdom, there dwelt two giants, who did much harm by the way they robbed, murdered, burnt, and plundered everything about them. No one could approach them without endangering his life. If he could overcome and kill these two giants, he should have the king's only daughter for a wife and half his kingdom into the bargain. He might have a hundred horsemen, too, to back him up. That's the very thing for a man like me. One doesn't get the offer of a beautiful princess and half a kingdom every day. Done with you. I'll soon put an end to the giants. But I haven't the smallest need of your hundred horsemen. A fellow who can slay seven men at a blow did not be afraid of two. The little tailor set out, and the hundred horsemen followed him. When he came to the outskirts of the wood, he said to his followers, You wait here. I'll manage the giants by myself. And he went out into the wood, casting his sharp little eyes right and left about him. After a while, he spied the two giants lying asleep under a tree, snoring till the very boughs bent with the breeze. The little tailor lost no time in filling his wallet with stones and then climbed up the tree under which they lay. When he got to about the middle of it, he slipped along a branch till he sat just above the sleepers, when he threw down one stone after the other on the nearest giant. The giant felt nothing for a long time, but at last he woke up, and pinching his companion said, "Mm, What did you strike me for? I didn't strike you. You must be dreaming. They both lay down to sleep again, and the tailor threw down a stone on the second giant, who sprang up and cried, Uh, What's that for? Why did you throw something at me? I didn't throw anything. They wrangled on for a time, till as both were tired, they made up the matter and fell asleep again. The little tailor began his game once more, and flung the largest stone he could find in his wallet with all his force, and he hit the first giant on the chest. This is too much of a good thing. And springing up like a madman, he knocked his companion against the tree till he trembled. He gave, however, as good as he got, and they became so enraged that they tore up trees and beat each other with them, till they both fell dead at once on the ground. Then the little tailor jumped down. It's a mercy that they didn't root up the tree on which I was sitting, or I should have had to jump like a squirrel onto another, which, nimble though I am, would have been no easy job. He drew his sword and gave each of the giants a very fine thrust or two on the breast, and then went to the horseman and said, The deed is done. I've put an end to the two of them, but I assure you it has been no easy matter, for they even tore up the trees in their struggle to defend themselves. But that's of no use against one who slays seven men at a blow. Weren't you wounded? No fear. They haven't touched a hair of my head. But the horsemen wouldn't believe him till they rode into the wood and found the giants weltering in their blood and the trees lying around, torn up by the roots. The little tailor now demanded the promised reward, but the king repented his promise and pondered once more how he could rid himself of the hero. Before you obtain the hand of my daughter and half my kingdom, 
You must do another deed of valor. A unicorn is running about loose in the wood and doing much mischief. You must first catch it. I'm even less afraid of one unicorn than of two giants. Seven at a blow. That's my motto. He took a piece of cord and an axe with him, went out into the wood, and again told the men who had been sent with him to remain outside. He hadn't to search long, for the unicorn soon passed by, and on perceiving the tailor, dashed straight at him as though it were going to spike him on the spot. Gently, gently, not so fast, my friend. And standing still, he waited till the beast was quite near, when he sprang lightly behind a tree. The unicorn ran with all its force against the tree and rammed its horn so firmly into the trunk that it had no strength left to pull it out again and was thus successfully captured. Now I've caught my bird, said the tailor, and he came out from behind the tree, placed the cord round its neck first, then struck the horn out of the tree with his axe, and when everything was in order, led the beast before the king. Still, the king didn't want to give him the promised reward, and made a third demand. The tailor was to catch a wild boar for him that did a great deal of harm in the wood, and he might have the huntsman to help him. Willingly, that's mere child's play. But he didn't take the huntsman into the wood with him, and they were well enough pleased to remain behind, for the wild boar had often received them in a manner which did not make them desire its further acquaintance. As soon as the boar perceived the tailor, it ran at him with foaming mouth and gleaming teeth and tried to knock him down. But our alert little friend ran into a chapel that stood near and got out of the window with a jump. The boar pursued him into the church, but the tailor skipped round to the door and closed it securely. So the raging beast was caught, for it was far too heavy and unwieldy to spring out of the window. The little tailor summoned the huntsmen together that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes. Then the hero betook himself to the king, who was obliged now, whether he liked it or not, to keep his promise, and hand him over his daughter and half the kingdom. Had he known that no hero warrior, but only a little tailor stood before him, it would have gone even more to his heart. So the wedding was celebrated with much splendor and little joy, and the tailor became a king. After a time, the queen heard her husband saying one night in his sleep, My lad, make that waistcoat and patch these trousers, or I'll box your ears. Thus she learned in what rank the young gentleman had been born. And next day she poured forth her woes to her father, and begged him to help her to get rid of a husband who was nothing more nor less than a tailor. The king comforted her and said, Leave your bedroom door open tonight. My servants shall stand outside, and when your husband is fast asleep, they shall enter. Bind him fast and carry him onto a ship, which shall sail away out into the wide ocean. The queen was well satisfied with the idea, but the armor-bearer, who had overheard everything, being much attached to his young master, went straight to him and revealed the whole plot. I'll soon put a stop to the business. That night, he and his wife went to bed at the usual time. And when she thought he had fallen asleep, she got up, opened the door, and then lay down again. The little tailor, who had only pretended to be asleep, began to call out in a clear voice. My lad, make that waistcoat and patch these trousers or I'll box your ears. I have killed seven at a blow slain two giants, led a unicorn captive, and caught a wild boar. Then why should I be afraid of those men standing outside my door? The men, when they heard the tailor saying these words, were so terrified that they fled as if pursued by a wild army and didn't dare go near him again. So the little tailor was and remained a king all the days of his life. That was a fun little story. I hope you enjoyed the adventures of the brave little tailor. Now, what can we learn from this story? As I read more of these classics, I've come to realize that recognizing the wisdom and lessons in the stories 
is not always clear or obvious, and it takes some diligent discernment to harvest what is good, beautiful, and true. For example, several of the previous stories have included a main character and hero, Puss in Boots, for example, who tricked, cheated, and lied in order to get ahead in life. That makes for an entertaining story, but it is not a good way to live and is certain to have negative consequences eventually. I think our tailor was not as rotten as some previous characters because he took advantage of the opportunities that came his way, such as entering the king's service as an officer, and then used his intelligence to complete the challenges the king proposed to him, and won his just reward. I also noticed the king was not a good king at all. Do you agree? Why or why not? I think he was a bad king because he was not honest. He went back on his promises several times. First, he promised the tailor that he would marry his daughter and win half the kingdom if he defeated the giants. When the tailor did that, the king went back on his promise and said he must now capture the unicorn. When the tailor accomplished that, the king went back on his word again and ordered that he must defeat the wild boar first. Finally, the king made good on his promise by giving his daughter's hand in marriage and half the kingdom to the tailor. And would you know it, not much time goes by and the king allowed himself to be influenced by his daughter and went back on his promise again and plotted to kidnap the tailor. But what happened? The tailor had a loyal servant that warned him of the evil plan and the tailor was able to protect himself at last. When it comes to our past characters who tricked, cheated, and lied, the lesson is this, junior scholars. The only good way to get ahead in life is through honesty, hard work, and improving your skills and knowledge, as well as surrounding yourself by good people. When it comes to the bad king, remember to let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. That means make good on your promises, a man's word should be able to be taken as the truth. Until next time, my junior scholars, be brave, be loyal, and speak the truth. Now for you parents out there, I want you to understand why we are doing this, what we are trying to achieve, and how you can help us. This is a rescue operation to preserve the classics and the wisdom within before it is lost forever. Our goal is to inspire children with a love of good reading by safeguarding and breathing new life into the greatest stories in history and empower you, the parents, with a resource you can trust to enrich your child's mind and spirit. We don't want these stories and the wisdom within to be forgotten so our children don't have to learn these lessons on their own. The most important thing you can do for us is to spread the message and tell others about these stories and what we are doing. If you want to donate, we would love that as well. My promise is that 100% of donations will go to building the impact and quality of the junior classics. If you have feedback and thoughts on how we can do things better, please send an email to thejuniorclassics at gmail.com.
listening to the Junior Classic.